David Levin, and welcome to Pop Goes the Culture, the -the behind-the-scenes anecdotes of your favorite shows from the people who were there. Today, part three of one of my favorite interviews with Gilligan's Island and Brady Bunch creator Sherwood Schwartz, who wraps up his story about the network meeting that sold the Gilligan's Island series through music. Plus, you'll never guess who wrote the incidental music for that series. Schwartz reveals the original actors he wanted to cast in the roles of Gilligan and the other castaways, and he reminisces about Alan Hale and Bob Denver. So I, I came to this meeting the next morning to explain what I meant by the song, and as soon as I opened my mouth, Jim said, look, we keep arguing about it. We've been arguing for a month. Actually, it was two months, but it was now I had to, I was given 20 minutes now to convince him. So I took out, I had my secretary prepare 20 sheets of, 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 the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the lyrics. And so I started to pass out the lyrics. And Jim said, Sherwood, you say that's a song? I said, yeah, I said, these are the lyrics. He said, songs weren't meant to be passed around. Songs are meant to be sung. Well, I don't have much of a voice. <laughs> At my bar mitzvah, people took back their presence when I sang. Anyway, I, it was put up or shut up, you know? And uh, there's a famous saying, but I don't remember it, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, I said, well, I said something like, you want me to sing? I'll sing. Because it was I had no choice. You know, and there is an old saying that the necessity is the mother of invention. So if I, I had to, maybe the door would open a crack if I at least could explain with my, my lyrics and my, my voice. And so I said, okay, you want me to sing? I'll sing. So I got up and there's 20 executives now. One of them later told me that Frank Sinatra had come to a meeting to explain what he was talking about, and he wouldn't sing. <laughs> Ignorance is great. So I got up and I sang this Calypso version of, of Gilligan's Island, which did explain what I was talking about. So no exposition was necessary. So when I was through, there was silence in the room. It was always silent until he spoke and when he spoke, he said, Sherwood, I think you can improve the middle lyrics a little. That's all he said. But that's tantamount to saying, I now understand what you're talking about, and there is no exposition, and you're right. And so that's, that's how he sold the show, actually. It worked. You, you, you made it work. It worked. I hear that on the original pilot, uh, John Williams did the original music for that. Is that true? It's true in this sense. He did the in-between uh, music, mm-hmm. the background music. He did the, the uh, Gilligan theme, da-da-dum, 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 dum. Oh. And he did the, the Skipper's theme. He did the themes of the end, but I wrote the, the, uh, the, lyrics, the, for the, 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 the lyrics for the actual song. And George Weil, who was a friend of mine, did, did the sea chanty melody. But the in-between stuff was, was uh, John Williams. Now, who were some of the people who were um, up for the roles? Because I know that the pilot had a different, slightly different cast than the... Yes, it did. First of all, I didn't even know Gilligan. I didn't know Bob Denver, who incidentally was just had, had uh, a quadruple bypass. Is he all right? Yeah, he's okay. But just two weeks ago. And so he, he was a very talented guy, but I didn't know him. In fact, I knew uh, uh, a guy I wanted for the role who eventually became the, the funny guy and coach, Jerry Van Dyke. That's who I wanted for the, for the role. I knew him, but I didn't know Bob Denver. So uh, anyway, he didn't want to do it because his agent told him it would be a failure, this show. 
It wasn't a failure. I hope he fired his agent. He was doing my mother the car the next year. That's what he, that's what he chose instead of Gilligan's Island. Could you say it? Because they're not going to hear me. Oh, sorry. That's okay. I wanted uh, uh, Jerry Van Dyke, but he's his agent, uh, who incidentally was my agent, because I sent Jerry Van Dyke to my agent because he didn't know an agent when he got here from Texas. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so uh, his agent, my agent, told him that Gilligan's Island wouldn't ever be a success. And Jerry didn't know, so he said, okay, he would take my mother the car instead. Mike told, my agent said mother the car would be a hit. So as a result of that, I didn't get Jerry Van Dyke, and my agent was fired. <laughs> I, I left my agent. Mm -hmm. So I understand the skipper also was originally supposed to be, you had someone else in mind, potentially? I didn't have anybody in mind for the skipper. Well, uh, was Carol O'Connor up for the role? Yes. Could you talk about that? But yeah. A lot of people came in to read for the skipper. In fact, uh, a lot of people were interviewed in New York for the role, including Carol O'Connor. But that was a, that's a very difficult role. It, it sounds easy, you know, just a big blustery guy. But you had to be so lovable in that character that no matter how you yelled at Gilligan, and bawled him out for doing all these stupid things, you had to know that he really liked him and loved him as, a, as his best friend, really. And so everybody flunked that test. I must have interviewed 30 or 40 skippers, good actors. Who were some of the people you might have spoken to? A guy named Strauss. Uh, I don't remember, you know, we're talking right. 50 years ago. Right. <laughs> it's a drop in the bucket. A drop in the like bucket. yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, in, in those years, it was very difficult. I mean, as I say, it sounds like an easy part. A big guy, a big blustery guy, and a, and a skinny guy. Uh, in fact, after that became the pair, any time we would do, go anywhere, the skipper loved, I mean, Alan Hale loved that outfit. He wore that cap and that that blue shirt, he'd wear it every place, and he, and he loved being the skipper. And so anytime there, any place with a, with a, with a any, any, any stand-in who wore a blue sh shirt with, a, with, a, with a, a skinny guy next to him, they assumed it was uh, Denver and Hale. But uh, it was great. He was, a ter he was one of the nicest people I ever met in my life. Alan Hale. In the park. Oh, it was wonderful. Next time, part four of my eight part conversation with Sherwood Schwartz. We'll finish our talk about casting Gilligan's Island. You'll learn who didn't get the part, Schwartz's other casting cho choices, and you will not believe who tried out for the part of Marianne. Also, why the skipper was such a hard role to cast, and how Alan Hale eventually landed the role. All that, and why they switched out the Professor, Marianne, and Ginger from the original, unaired pilot. Meanwhile, if you like what we're doing, get your name on the show, support me on Patreon, and leave me a note. Who's your type? Marianne? Ginger? Mrs. Howell? And not to be biased, Gilligan? Skipper? The Professor? Thurston Howell III? And don't forget to tell me why in the comments. I will see you next time.